All right, good afternoon, everyone. It is exactly two o'clock. We are going to get started on time so we can get you out of here on time and keep the day moving. Um, I'm really excited that you all have decided to join us today. I realize that this panel might seem a little out of place this week. Um, and as you're going through today's conversation, the other conversations that you're having, I hope that you will think about why. Why it is that this group of students are so far removed from the conversations that we have about innovation, about education technology, about really the forefront of what we know about how kids learn. Um, so today we're gonna be talking about a group of students that you won't find online. Uh, if you wanna dive deeper into the education technology piece of this, I actually have a piece today that I've published um, on our blog. It's called Ahead of the Herd, H-E-A-R-D. Um, talking about access and content and the reason that we don't hear a lot about education technology in juvenile justice spaces and in correction spaces. What we're here to talk to you about today though with the San Diego County Office of Education is a different kind of innovation um, and the innovations that they're putting in place for the students in their care today. So we've come to you since you can't find us on your computers. Um, we also believe this can't remain a niche conversation. This can't remain conversations that we have among each other. Um, we really want to drag this into mainstream education discourse and I'm hopeful that you all are gonna help us. So a little bit of framing for you to understand. Um, how many people in the room, just raise your hand if you have ever been in any sort of secure facility. Maybe you were visiting, working, mm. you're self-incarcerated, I won't ask you to give any more <laughs> details. Um, so it's actually a lot of people in the room, which is unusual. Um, we don't often find spaces like this where folks have any experience. So what I wanna do is give you a little bit of framing, think about what's going on at the national level, the national picture, and then we'll dive into what's happening in San Diego County. So there are 2,600 secure schools in the country, roughly. Uh, we actually don't have a good count. There isn't a good data metric. Many of them are private providers. What qualifies as a high school is defined at the state level, but roughly about 2,600, serving approximately 60,000 kids on a given day. Now that 60,000 are the kids behind bars today. What that doesn't account for is the churn over the course of a year. There are tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of kids who will sit in one of these classrooms during the course of a year. Approximately 60, 000, excuse me, approximately 60 percent of those kids, maybe more, qualify for special education services. Most of them are far below grade level and many of them have been out of school for three to five years. Less than 40 percent of kids will ever return to school after leaving custodial care. And high school dropouts are three and a half times more likely to be arrested as adults. So let's get into San Diego County. In California, jurisdiction over these schools is given by state law to county offices of education. So the San Diego County Office of Education provides education services in lots of different spaces. One of them in particular is for adjudicated youth and they're gonna talk with us today about what that means, what that looks like, and what they're doing differently. I've been given very strict instructions to not spend a lot of time on introductions. Everyone's bios are available on your ASU GSV app. We're gonna dive right into the conversation uh, and hopefully be able to reveal some of the good stuff going on. So I think I'll start kind of with any of you who wants to jump in, tell me, tell me why. Why do you do what you do? What is your goal? What's your vision? I can call on someone. Don't be shy. I'll, I'll start off. Um, uh, one, of, one of the students uh, of mine, the very first year I was teaching, uh, her name is Vanessa Neely. Uh, Vanessa uh, came from a, a very um, tough um, upbringing, um, multiple uh, traumatic experiences in her life. And so at the beginning of each day, we'd always put a prompt on the board just to try to you know, break the ice and get the kids talking and kind of welcome them back to the, to the school. And a very simple prompt was, uh, why is education important to you? And her response was, because when you learn something, no one can take it away from you and throw it in the trash. And this is a young lady who constantly had her possessions taken away and, and you know, thrown in the trash throughout her entire upbringing. So that, that's why I do the work that I do, because there are so many Vanessas in San Diego County and throughout the, throughout the country that the work is vital and every single child does matter. 
that, that's why I, I do the work that I do. Well, I do the work that I do because, uh, is my mic on? Or, oh, there we go. I do the work, that, I'm Cynthia Burton, and I do the work that I do because when I was in college uh, getting my undergraduate degree, um, I had a, a, one, a fellow student uh, came up to me and asked me, hey, would you like a job? And at that time I was just working as a, I was working as a, a delivery, I delivered floor, flowers. And I said, sure, and she sent me to her father who was a principal of a school. And she said, give him a call. She handed me a piece of paper with his number on it. I called his, uh, this number. His name was Chuck Lee, he was a principal of the school which I did not know was Juvenile Hall. And so when I showed up for my job interview, I called him, I was outside and said, I think I have the wrong school. <laughs> and he said, no, you're at the right place. And as I walked through the quarters and the, the steel doors closed behind me, I wondered, how did these kids get here? Because I was very much close to their age. I was only 18 years old when I, when I was applying for this job as a TA at Juvenile Hall. And as I, after I got the job, I was constantly questioning myself and others as to how did these young people get behind bars. And one of the things I knew that I had that kept me from being behind bars was the fact that I had a very strong family um, support. And uh, I do the work for family engagement because I realize how important it is to education and to keeping these young people um, out of um, the court system and into a real viable lifestyle. What about you, Joe? Um, I mean, uh, like, like Sean, I have so many students in my past and, and you that in, have inspired me. And, and for me, it's you just never know when, when students are going to turn a corner and uh, latch on to those valuable learning opportunities that have been presented to them and uh, just kind of get hooked into something and, and, and find their way to their diploma or to uh, college or get that job. And so um, I think of a lot of kids, but um, Monarch is, is, is a little bit different because we're not, we're not adjudicated youth, um, but we are one of the offerings, the, the learning opportunities and innovative programs that our district has serving 300 students impacted by homelessness um, only about a 15 to 20 minute walk from here. So it's le less than a mile from here. Um, though I guess depends on how fast you walk. Um, but uh, so it's, it's, it's uh, strategically located in the downtown area, um, which is if you kind of go a little bit southeast away from where all, all the convention uh, uh, stuff is and the gas lamp, you'll see uh, you know, folks here in San Diego that are still living on the streets and, and depending on uh, charitable resources, uh, shelters, and transitional housing, and families that live in tents and in their cars. And so um, we are a very unique public-private <coughs> partnership that uh, really provides um, learning for students in very unique ways that encompasses the whole child. And so uh, it's really inspiring to me to go to work every day and interact with our kids and know that uh, the, the, this proof of concept is a national model and uh, it, it's amazing to have a conversation with my colleagues on this stage because I know that we want all of our students in our district to have um, the opportunities uh, afforded to uh, kids at Monarch uh, with its community-based approach. So Stacey, can you tell us a little bit more? We talk about a national model, we talk about innovation. What are you doing differently? In particular with our partnership uh, with probation, we're focusing on rehabilitation and um, therapy rather than a command and control model. Historically adjudicated youth, it's about punishment and it's about control. It's about you've done something wrong and so there are going to be consequences for that. And so it creates this cycle in which it's very difficult for students to come out of. Um, they're, they're missing out of school or the schooling that they have access to why they are adjudicated is very um, remedial. It is not something that is grade level appropriate. It probably doesn't match what they were learning when they were at their home school. And so we've taken that and we've done a lot of work partnering with our probation um, partners to say that needs to look different. We actually have to address the root causes of why students are here. And so what does that look like? Because we know that sometimes the adults have been institutionalized to these practices as well. And so how do we actually form relationships with students 
to know who they are as learners and what are those situations that got them here so that we can actually break that cycle. Um, we've had to have a lot of conversations with probation to actually address those issues. Mm -hmm. And we've had to say, we might not be able to um, you know, address the issues of poverty in community. We might not be able to address um, you know, all of those issues outside of these walls, but what do we have control over within these walls from probation and from education that we have control over. And we have control over our behavior. We have control over our beliefs. We have control over our practices. And we have control over our language. And so how can we partner together? And so one of those very innovative practices um, in particular is our true unit. And that's the unit in which we have identified behavioral practices in which we work with students to look at their, um, the traumas that have brought them to this place. And so there's therapy, there's behavior modification, there's counseling, then we also have educational practices in which um, our teacher works with the probation staff and students engage in problem-based learning in which they demonstrate their learning, their exhibitions of their learning, they um, receive critique and probation staff are actually a part of that process as well. And then there are transitional services so that the students as they leave the unit have skills and strategies that they can use as they exit the unit and then also exit into schooling or work and so that they're able to code switch. And that's very distinct not only to probationary practices but learning as well. So Stacy, um, a lot of what you're describing is it, it really is the learning environment, right? And so as we look out uh, into this beautiful room, we were kind of laughing as we came in because of the <laughs> formation. Are you all familiar? Have you ever heard the term the cemetery formation related to education? Well, that's that's what this is. It's desks and rows, right? And we call it the cemetery formation because it doesn't allow for any interaction or collaboration or communication. And so that work with probation that, that Stacy's describing has been so important because command and control means sitting in rows, facing forward, not talking, not standing up, not asking questions. And so that's the work that we've been engaged in with probation so that our kids can actually talk and collaborate like folks do in the, in the real world. So um, this was actually a good prop for us. I was pleased when we walked in to see this. Well, and, and in that, context, Sean, we get to know who the students are, right? I yeah. mean, we <clears throat> know them as learners, and that's part of the what we call personalization of learning. Um, so that's one way to develop agency in students. I know there are some very interesting learners out here, but I, I don't know you because of this configuration. Yeah. Um, I know Jean, right? And she's very <laughs> interesting. Um, but it, it's really important um, for the students to be able to be understood as learners, and they know, you know, that Joe um, at Monarch or, or Sean you know, has responsibility for the court schools, understands who they are, calls them by name, and understands what their goals are, and understands um, what they want to do. Um, you know, they're often with us for a short period of time, and then what's the next step? You know, where, where are they going from, from um, our enrollment? Okay. So there, go ahead. I was going to give two very specific examples of the partnership and how the change in adult practice impacts student learning. One is even the use of language. Um, in the facilities, adults will say, you know, Ward Specter, um, Ward, um, you know, Brian. So the students are only known as their last name. And that's very dehumanizing. And yet we know to reduce trauma, re reduce an affect, you're known by your name. It's, it's Wendell, it's Sean. Um, but for adults and probation officers or line staff, um, that's a way in which they remove themselves from the situation and, and create that control. And so we've been working with probation to change that practice and say, you know, just by using Cynthia's name or Joe's name and creating that relationship, you can actually reduce the incidences of violence or behavior in the unit because you do have a relationship with that student. 
and changing that language changes that adult practice which then changes the relationship with the student or the ward and reduces that behavior and interestingly enough in the true unit we've seen a significant significant reduction in behavioral incidences um, with the students in that unit and um, we're tracking and monitoring um, that piece and we expect that we would see that then in the other units as that same practice is then applied in the other units. Another example of behavior or practice changing is for students to actually be released to have experiences outside of the units. And so this has been a huge undertaking with our partners in probation, but we've been able to have students released to participate in experiences outside. One being that students are able to participate in uh, field trips to um, um, the Old Globe Theater, to the La Jolla Playhouse, um, and actually at the La Jolla Playhouse, we had students from Camp Barrett who were in a week-long apprenticeship learning about stagecraft. And they were actually um, highlighted as some of the most um, engaged and well-behaved students that they've ever <coughs> worked with. And talk about real world um, application of learning. We have a space at the county office that um, you know bushes sort of overrun with um, varmints, if you will, um, where we were having some um, um, some landscaping redone. And we said, well, talk about real world, you know, application. We had students from one of the facilities put together a design proposal just like you would with any other landscape architecture. They did studies of the salinity and whatnot of the, the, um, the soil and you know, uh, what plants would work and everything, put together a proposal of the design and whatnot, and over the course of the last year have put together that landscape. And so now it is an open air and open space learning environment for all visitors to the San Diego County Office of Education not only for employees that work there, but for the thousands of visitors that visit the county office over the course of any year. And they put that together, they cost it out, they designed it, they put it together, they built it, and it is beautiful. And it's a real world experience, but it's, and it was learning for them, and it was a partnership that had to be very carefully negotiated with our partnership with probation. Um, but it was because it was learning that was necessary for students. It was real world, it was authentic, and it demonstrated the learning for students, and we were able to name everything they did in the process so that we could demonstrate that to the adults that our students are more than capable of doing this work. So I have a question, Sean and Cynthia, maybe, Joe. This all sounds great, right? This sounds wonderful. This is what I want my kid doing at school. These kids, not a blanket statement, but often have committed real crimes with real victims. Why is it that we ought to be dedicating this kind of energy, time, thought, resources when there's high need out there in San Diego? There are other kids who haven't committed any crimes who don't get chances to make pitches for landscape design. Um, why these kids? Well, you looked at me, so I'm gonna go ahead and speak. <laughs> Our kids today are being raised in a very desensitized society now. And there's um, most of our kids, and we'll move past the millennials because they're still trying to figure out what to call the upcoming uh, <laughs> young people that are coming through. Um, but when you think about most of our kids that we're educating now have seen um, two wars. There is another rise or, um, of racial injustice. There are these families that the kids come from are sometimes very dysfunctional families that have less opportunity to understand how to connect and build positive communities around them. So part of what the work that we do with our students and families is, is to give them a skill set, especially through our, our restorative <coughs> practices that we're now doing with JCCS, is that it's important to be in connection and contact and in feeling with other people around you. And sometimes the crimes that they have committed are because they are desensitized, because they're not feeling, they're not understanding, they're not um, giving an opportunity to communicate and to accept and talk about their harm that they've caused, not only to themselves, but to others. 
And so why do we offer this? It's really because I think as we move this next generation out into the real world, that we want the real world to feel more and to know more and to be able to communicate better and to have that opportunity to be able to say, if I have your child out there, any one of you that have children, in our educational setting, we could have your, your child six hours or more a day. And if we aren't teaching your child how to be humanistic to one another and how to connect with one another and build community with each other in a positive way, then we're doing less than right. I think we're, we're being remiss, I should say, in, in the part of education. So that's why I feel compelled to do the work that I do with the families and with the, with the young people because there is such a hard world outside those doors and we need to help them and others learn how to connect with each other better. I, I think if we don't, it makes the situation worse. We know punishment doesn't work because uh, I've been doing this for 17 years. We've all seen the same kids cycle through um, after being treated very much in the same way, right? Um, the other consideration is so many of the students that we have when they're adjudicated, when they're incarcerated, they're already behind. And you could argue is that causal or is that effect? Um, it, it's neither here nor there really. What we do know is if we really hope to um, have any kind of rehabilitative outcome, education needs to be a piece of that. And so when you have a learner whose needs have been neglected for so long, like many of our students, um, we're compelled to then provide a more, um, uh, a deeper, a more impactful learning environment. So yes, you can make the argument these students have, um, there's a reason for them to be with us. Um, and sometimes I want to make the point, sometimes that's a probation violation. Sometimes that's a curfew <laughs> violation, bad. right? These are, the, major, the majority of our students are not felons. They're not uh, violent um, criminals. They're, they've had a dirty pee test or they've stayed out too late or there's many, many, many ways to be incarcerated, right, when you're a teenager. Um, now, with that said, we do have some violent felons, right? Um, the, the point is, if we don't, um, do everything we can to provide the best possible education for the students when we have them, their outcome is that much worse. I mean, yeah. com completing either an equivalency or a diploma um, is probably one of the best um, predictors of the student not recidivating. So it, it's really, I think at the end of the day, it's a really uh, wise use of public funds to make the educational programs in juvenile halls, in camps, uh, the best we can possibly make them. And um, this year, uh, tax day is today. That's right, right? it is. And so, uh, knowing your audience, how, how many of you folks pay taxes? Right, everybody, in some way, shape, or form. There was a, an article in the LA Times a couple months ago, $230,000 per year to keep a kid locked up in LA County. Much better off in San Diego. I think it's only like 125 we or something yeah, like that. But, but just think of that. Think of the number of kids. LA, I think, has five or 6,000 kids, students, on a daily basis in their court schools. And here in San Diego, it's, it's probably about 700. Mm -hmm. But just think of the impact, that fiscal impact on a community. Um, we're all in it, you know, for the reason Cynthia w w was talking about, you know, because we believe in, in the child and we believe, you know, that, that every child has, has unlimited potential. And sometimes the audience you speak to needs to hear a little bit different point of view. So um, that, that, that fiscal um, perspective is something that has to always be in the discussion as well. So I want to come back to that, but Joe, do you have anything more to add on that? You know, I'm just thinking about the links because obviously my students are, are referred to me in a, in a kind of a different way and, and, uh, and obviously they have a, a lot of trauma going on in, in their lives and I'd hate for them to have to go through uh, being incarcerated on top of that. So, um, but one of the common links is just the, the on, ongoing and onslaught of, of, of trauma that our kids experience uh, in dealing with poverty. Um, and so just, just be, keeping trauma in mind and how it uh, rewires the brain and impacts learning and really informs us uh, how we need to approach our kids uh, in a supportive way where we really can personalize and get to know them um, and build community and do uh, just engage them in a way where their voice matters is, is so important whether you're at the Monarch School or whether you're my colleagues in a gated facility and so I know um, that's definitely been a, a, an effort uh, on our part in our programming uh, across the board. And so it just makes such a difference um, when, you, when you truly get to know your kids and, uh, and have the supports and resources for them. 
Yeah. So I want to go back, Sean, to your point about the economics of this. Right? These are public dollars. So tell me a little bit more about the trajectory of a student's life. We have a, a terrible habit in education of thinking in terms of bureaucracies and buildings. This is what happens in this building. This is what happens in this building. And much less energy and effort is spent thinking in terms of the trajectory of an individual young person's life. So let's think a little bit about the before and the after. And I'm going to start with the after. Right? You have kids for a short amount of time. What's your average length of stay? Six months? Nine months? Not even. It's less than that. Months. Yeah, less than that. Um, we measure it in days. So all of this thought, all of this energy, this $130,000, $230,000 that are going into building what we would like to see as therapeutic rehabilitative spaces, almost without exception, these kids go home. Mm -hmm. What happens then? What should happen? What doesn't happen that needs to happen? Well, I, well, I think it goes back to the education should not just be with just the child in terms of it, if you put a dollar sign to it, because they, you're right, they do go back home. So we should be educating the whole child, the, the family, the community, all those who are involved with this. It takes a whole, a whole community, I won't say village, a whole community <laughs> to educate a child. So we all have to be engaged in that educational piece because then I can see my, my return on investment. If I'm looking at as a community member, as a pastor of a church, as a parent, as a teacher, as a 7-Eleven clerk, if we're looking at, and this is kind of the way we look at really the, mm -hmm. um, when we send these kids back out into community, how is it affecting that community? Are, are we taking them, sending them back out to make it worse or better? And so if our return on investment is about looking at the whole child and who surrounds that child, and we're connecting with those people, then I think we have a better sense of where their child is going to go to be some more successful than just saying, get your math, English, history, graduate out, go to college, see you later, bye, and we haven't taught them anything else. That's mm -hmm. critical to me in the work that I do. We also have to look at the root cause. Um, if you look over the last 10 years, actually, for adjudicated youth, we've actually seen a steep decline in the number of students that we actually see. But the students who we do see um, have significant more needs. Um, the number of students who um, are using opioid use has increased. The number of students who um, have IEPs and those, of course, who are um, experiencing some type of significant trauma. And so fewer students, but higher needs. And so we need to look at the root causes of what those traumas are and address those as part of the program for the time in which they are with us so that those issues are being addressed and there's that continuum of care for when they're with us and when they leave. And that needs to involve the family mm -hmm that needs to involve the student because oftentimes it's, well, here's your meds while you're here. Oftentimes it hasn't involved therapy and now it is like with the true unit. And so here's the therapy, here's medication if appropriate. And then here's what that continuum of care is for when you're released. Here's then what that means for um, if you're going back to your school of residence or what that means if you continue with one of our community schools. So what is that personalized learning plan? What is that transition plan? Because we know economically, if you continue with your schooling, rather than returning back, because it's a very vicious cycle, it's better for you economically as well as for society. And that's what ultimately our goal is. Even though I have a very strong partnership with probation, Every single time I sit down at the table, I tell probation, I'm here to put you out of a job. Because we need our students to be healthy, viable members of a community so that they're economically viable. Because I don't believe any one of us, and I would challenge members of um, the group here, I don't believe any parent or anyone has ever raised their hand and said, I want to live in poverty. I want my child to live in poverty. I don't think so. I want my child to know success. I want my child to have better than I have had. 
And so we need to provide opportunities that our students not only are learning the skills and the requisite knowledge that the community is demanding of them, but they're able to code switch appropriately to apply those skills to do that for themselves so that they have the agency to access whatever it is they need to manage that for themselves. Mm. Yeah, I'm hoping, Joe, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what that process looks like of handing ownership and agency over to kids themselves so mm. that they're really the architects of their future. What does that really look like in a classroom? So in, in practice at our school, um, one of the things that we rolled out this last year is um, personal growth plans. And they're aligned to our organizational framework which takes into account the whole student, which are learning across social, emotional, um, academic, and life skill um, pillars. And so each student uh, comes up with a learning target in each of those four areas, and we can directly, and then they can, they identify opportunities that they're gonna take advantage of so that they can be exposed to, to, to those learnings and we celebrate their accomplishments as we go throughout the year. And you, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a real concrete way for a kid to uh, demonstrate how they've become a leader on campus uh, by starting a new club or uh, joining an athletics team. Um, it, it could also, uh, they could demonstrate how they develop new life skills by going to the DMV and getting uh, an identification, identification card or building a resume and actually joining our internship program. And so it's just a real concrete way to, to measure success that's more than just test scores and, and grades. And um, really the idea is we want kids to be able to transfer this, this goal setting to their lives when they, leave, when they leave school and continue to challenge themselves in very uh, specific and granular ways so that they know they're continually improving, continually engaging in, in learning and, and, and taking advantage of the opportunities put in front of them. Well, it's like those restorative practices that Cynthia and her team are working on with yours because we know, again, in the work world, if I have an issue with Wendell, I'm not going to mad dog him and hit him. I need to be able to... She might. <laughs> I know, just might. We need to be able to engage in conflict management yeah. in, in meaningful ways. And so restorative practices support students and adults in being able to create that community and knowing that you're a part of it. At the, at the same time, it, it's really it's moving away from that culture of politeness mm -hmm. that we've operated in um, both with probation as well as with our own staff and, and each other yeah. to really stretching each other to have difficult decisions um, instead of just allowing silence to carry the day um, and, and perpetuating the, the status quo and so, so the, you know it, it's not disrespectful it's not in your face but but really moving away from just you know patting each other on the back for the fine job everybody's doing we all know that as professionals we have areas for growth and we have to be humble enough to admit that and then to reflect and then to really act on it. And I think one of the areas that we've really grown in over the last few years is having those difficult discussions with probation. You know, and, and I think we, we need to continue to do that. I think the other piece of work that um, we have engaged in that to me is the telltale sign is the staff that are willing to be restorative themselves first so that the kids can follow their lead. So if you haven't been in a restorative place, if you haven't learned as, a, as the adult that's leading the young people how to talk about your feelings and share feelings with the students as opposed to putting down punishment all the time because what you've done is wrong, so now I'm gonna show you how wrong it is by giving you another punishment, as opposed to talking about how we can right that, pun that wrong and that how we can go, we can be more in relationship and communication to each other, and how you will then be reintegrated back into the community as opposed to suspending you and sending you home for another two days to do the wrong over, over and over again, that we are now looking at how then do we build this community in our classroom, me being the, 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 ed, the adult educator here, how do I show you how to build relationship, positive relationships, and be able to be restorative in my being with you so that you can model that when you go out to be uh, in your home families or in your community with your friends so that we don't keep perpetuating the same harm over and over again. Mm -hmm. So it's really important for us to take the lead as the adults in that work. So what's your response when we think about the idea of handing autonomy and agency over to kids for people in this room, in other rooms, people's parents, people who've raised teenagers, <laughs> who think like, this is the last person in the world who needs to be making decisions about this kid's life. Look at the decisions he's made so far. 
Mm. How do you react to that? I think that's a very common first response of these kids aren't prepared to make decisions about their lives as demonstrated by the fact that they're in this building today. What is it that <clears throat> makes you feel that creating this culture of agency and autonomy is in fact the right thing to do? Well, you just said it, and Cynthia spoke to it, and, and that is creating that culture or that community that supports that. So it's, it's not like we hand them a box, here's your autonomy, mm -hmm. right? Nice. It's <laughs> happening in this um, learning environment that's addressing, um, as, as Cynthia so eloquently spoke of, the whole child. That's all learning. I mean, they're learning self-regulation. They're learning academic knowledge. They're learning how to interact with each other. That's the, um, the, the type of environment you need to create in order to foster agency and autonomy. And there's a lot of um, brain neuroscience that says, you know, the, the prefrontal cortex isn't fully developed until 22. And some would say, you know, my ex-husband, maybe not until 46 or so, but, you know, that's a judgment. Um, but we need it's to provide. <laughs> I know it's not. Um, but we have to provide, again, that culture and that community that says we're going to co-construct that and there's a safe place to do that. And it's also deconstructing schooling that it's not about command and control. It's not about if you have X number of minutes, that's X number of credits. It's not about here's a grade level. It's about developmental learning and what does learning look like and how does proficiency, you might develop or you might demonstrate an understanding of a mathematical idea or concept at a very different time than I do, even though we're both 14. You need to be able to demonstrate that. I need to be able to demonstrate that. So what are your passions? What are your interests? What is your personalized learning plan that might be very different than Joe's? Learning, and this summit is a perfect example of that. Learning is the new frontier. And we, Deep breath, everybody, have to be prepared to just create the time, space, opportunity, and support. Because think about it as adults sitting in this room. When we have a question or a problem that we want to solve, what do we do? We say, well, where's the information that I need to address that? Who's the person? Where's the resource? Where's the time? Where's the space to solve that? And we've learned how to do that with mentors um, receiving critique from others. Why then do we say to students, well, wait until you get out into the real world to be able to do that yourself, instead of saying, let's create a place where we can be side by side with you to show you how. That's what we're doing in thank you. <laughs> That's what we're doing in San Diego County in JCCS is we're creating those spaces to curate that alongside students so they have the agency to do that for themselves because that's what agency is. So in our last 12 minutes, um, I want to think about our audience. I want to think about who's in this building today. We've got educators from school districts. We've got higher ed folks. We've got plenty of vendors and potential private partners. What are the things that you need most? What are the things that people in this room could support you with, provide you with, do differently, effectively? How, how does this audience put you and me out of a job? Right? How do they keep kids out of these places to begin with? How do they transition them out smoothly with a different trajectory for their future that we don't see this intergenerationally? What do they need to do to make sure that we're not here anymore? Well, one important issue, and you brought it up sort of the end of your comments, is that issue of articulation or transition from incarceration back into the community. And just speaking from an educational perspective, um, one of the things we see consistently is where the services or the planning that's been put into place or that's been continued in, say, Juvenile Hall does not continue on into the community. Um, so Stacy talked about um, students who are identified with a psychiatric disorder, for example, and they may need a medication that is very important for their school success and also, more importantly, to keep them from recidivating. Right? 
And Cynthia and I were in a meeting uh, last week with parents, and one of the parents showed a story about her um, uh, son was released on a medication, mm. and the um, care was geographically very inconvenient for her to get to, and that, and she otherwise she'd had no access to healthcare to get that prescription filled. That the the lack of the, the uh, her son continuing those medications resulted in him being incarcerated again, and so you can almost draw a line from this student. You know, a, a need was identified that had a direct bearing on his school success. He was not able to continue those services out in the community. And then within, what, two weeks, yeah. he was back incarcerated. Now at a higher level of, of incarceration. You know what? Oh, go ahead, Sean. No, the gentleman in the back had a, had a question. Uh, yeah. It's very challenging for us to know how to help when we can look at Bloom with $100 million in funding and three legislatures saying, don't put my child's data in the cloud. It mm -hmm. sounds like so much of the continuity of data is a huge mm -hmm. challenge here. Yeah. Almost, you know, almost emotionally. Mm. About the great work that you're doing, but you know how much how much are you just catching the back end of a loop that you can't handle? Mm. Yeah, yeah. If you think of continuity continuity of data, continuity of care, and continuity of learning, yeah. and and that would go a long way to, to reducing uh, these arrests. Corporations having their children's data in the cloud that's just a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. And, and as an entrepreneur, I wouldn't feel safe having my child's data in the government. So that I mm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so one thing I will say to that, that's sort of independent of this conversation here, but in thinking about education technology, I think one of the biggest barriers to high quality provision of services is really lack of good student data, lack of good student information systems, lack of good assessment tools. So we haven't even gotten to that point, this idea of continuity of mm. data. It's just data collection, mm. right? Kids don't get arrested with transcripts. Mm. And so you have to sit down with them and say, like, what's the last high school you went to? What classes were you in? Did you finish them? Did you pass them? What grade did you? So I can decide what, what to enroll you in next. And so we think we're really dealing with part one of this. If we could have seamless continuity, of course, that would be incredible. There's concerns with that, all sorts of issues. But we're just talking about having baseline data, being able to send a kid out the door with a digital transcript yeah. that they can take when they go to another school. Rather than, you know, here's a packet of papers, be sure you don't lose anything. Like, I threw away my birth certificate last month. Um, you know, asking kids to sort of rely on these antiquated formats for data that I think for you all feels like it's 20 or 30 years ago. Yeah. This is what schools are still dealing with. For sure. I think data also starts right here. That if I know, uh, it, and I know this is like, you know, um, I'm dating myself, leave it to Beaver, you know, any, any maybe our RFD. I mean, for me, is that we don't know enough about our young people individually. Mm -hmm. That if we look, yeah. you look down your street in your neighborhood, how much data would you be able to give on your neighbor's child, or how much would your, your neighbor be able to give on your child? It's relationships. It's relationships, it's community building, it's, it's the work that I'm most engaged in doing in terms of, Yes, if I can get, if we can get together as a community and understand that young people need human connections and community, and that data starts there, and then we move it to a database. But the base really starts with where we work with each other, and that's the work that I think the hardest work that we do is trying to get humans to be human and to connect with one another, and the, and the world will change a lot faster. Yeah. Cynthia, do you have any thoughts in addition to that? About Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. About this idea around what could folks in our audience be doing to put you out of a job? Yes, to put me out of a job, and I, I, you don't have to do it real fast. Just take your time. <laughs> we time it down around the corner. Uh, to put me out of a job is really, you know, I do a self-assessment every day about uh, the work that I do in terms of, remember the story I told you at the beginning why I even got started in this work and I, when I went through juvenile hall and the, the doors started climbing, why wasn't I put, why haven't I, well, what decisions did I make or what decisions that were helped me make better decisions in terms of, of not being incarcerated and that was because I, my parents did their due diligence in terms of um, helping to raise me and other young people. Uh, if I, the work that I do is around parent engagement. 
Many times parents that are dealing with their incarcerated youth or their, your children that are in our community schools is because they don't have the support that they need in their communities. They don't have the support that they need um, sometimes even in the schools and we try to provide that support for them. The number one question I get asked for a workshop or support in is how can I communicate better with my child? And that's something that's very difficult once they become a teenager. So um, putting me out of the job would be that let's just work to communicate better with each other and with our young people in this world. I think, I think that would take me at least down closer to retirement if you would do that. I, I would add to that um, as well. Whether you're a district teacher, administrator, employee, whether you're a business owner, entrepreneur, um, citizen, Right, just having an awareness of um, what, juvenile, what the juvenile justice system is all about and, and how easy it is for kids to get sucked into that system with no hope or opportunity to get out. So from the, the seat in which you lead, um, how can you knock down some of those barriers? So if you're a small business owner and you hire somebody that's had a history with the juvenile justice system. Okay. If you work in a school district, you're a registrar, you know, in, in an office, open the door, don't slam the gate back, back in the kid's face, right? And so all of us have a role to play in that. And so when, if, when we knock down those barriers, the chance for, for success and for the kids not to recidivate is, is so much greater. And so we all have a, a, a role to play in that. Joe and then Stacy. So to put me out of uh, business. I, I think we need affordable housing solutions. Um, <laughs> it's so, yeah. so um, you know, we obviously we serve a very small fraction of the of the number of kids who are dealing with extreme poverty and homelessness in San Diego County. There's an estimated over 20,000 students that that fall into the that qualify as being homeless under under HUD and McKinney Vento in our county alone. Um, we only have about 300 students. Um, and, and the wait list, the Section 8 waiting list in San Diego is 12 plus years at this point. Um, the average price of a two bedroom apartment in San Diego is around $1,200 a month. Um, so we've, we, have a, we do have, obviously we're not in the business of providing housing, but we have formed some unique partnerships um, with our housing commission. And so we have 25 front of the line vouchers for families um, at Monarch and we are rolling that out as we speak. Um, we will have 10 families in homes within, by the end of this month, um, and we're able to tie on additional supports and resources when they get these vouchers uh, with strong expectations for attendance, parent involvement, and academic success. And so that's another, another piece that we're really proud of um, with the work that we're doing uh, to, to try and figure that, that, that out, but uh, it's, it's a huge issue that seems to only be getting worse at this time in our community. So as far as housing is concerned. Building on what Sean said, my ask of you doesn't come with a dollar sign, believe it or not. Regardless of the role from which you lead, when we come and ask you to spend time with our students, um, we come asking for you to be a part of our community because we want to be a part of your community. And so especially if you are local to San Diego, that might mean being a mentor in one of our schools to our students. It might mean sharing your expertise with our students. It might mean um, opening um, an internship pipeline into your um, business or um, um, your corporation, whatever it might mean. It just means establishing a relationship with our students and our schools so that we become a community on behalf of our students so that they become a member of your community. That's my ask of you. All right, so in our last 90 seconds, in our last 90 seconds, I'm going to let you all know if you have other questions, we'll meet you out in the foyer because there's an event immediately following us. Um, but does anyone on our panel have anything more that they would like to add um, that they feel like we didn't cover today, we didn't touch on, that I think is really essential for folks to understand about the work that you are doing and the work that they can do? Nothing? We got it all? Was there a question? <laughs> that, that's another that's another panel discussion. All right. Well, we <laughs> what have else we, can do? we have exactly one minute. So if you've got a question that you 
Want to fit into a minute? Right there was one. Yeah. I'll probably follow up with you afterwards. A fantastic panel, by the way. I really love some of the things I'm hearing. I feel that I can help. And I don't know if you even just want to do a show of hands as to how many organisations actually want to engage with you. I come from the UK. It's quite difficult to engage with school networks. And if you are open to innovating, I have funding to be able to come in and run a pilot that I really think can bring genuine change to your pupils and to your schools. But I just need schools to really engage. So yeah, I lied about not wanting money. We just need schools that are really open to trying new things and, and letting technology transform the lives of their people. Yeah, these Great. are very opaque systems. They're mm -hmm. very hard to penetrate. And I understand, you call the desk, people will hang up on you. Even if you say, like, I'd like to send you a check. Right. Someone's going to laugh and hang up the phone. Right. Um, yeah. You certainly can't yeah. knock on the door. There's no door to knock on. There's no address. There's no sign. So if you're interested in doing local work here in San Diego with this team here, they're yeah. happy to talk with you out there. I do work much more at the national level. So if you want to have conversations about finding pilot sites, connecting with schools, and almost every state in the country. Um, I'm going to be standing outside. I'll, take, I'll get my pencil out um, and be ready to have conversations with you about that. These are really nice. hard places to work in, and they're really hard places to work with. There's lots of different reasons for that. But what we can't do is say that that's enough of a reason for us to simply step aside, look away. It's a small number of kids. What are we really going to do? It's really hard to work in there. They don't have internet. They don't have technology. Oh, well. We it's have not internet, a good and we're easy to work with. So. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, that's not an answer anymore. It's not sufficient, and we need to do more, and we need to do better. We need to do it now. So thank you we all. We're going to step yes. out. Thank you. All right.